Okay. So, the disconnected learning institutions. <laughs> so, I think I missed a vital chapter in school. The one where they tell you, don't just learn from your teachers, learn from yourself. But that doesn't make sense. Isn't school about learning from others? And anyway, if I don't understand something, I'd wait for someone to tell me, right? <laughs> well, I'm 25 now and I still feel bad. I still feel intimidated, and I'm sure a lot of you too <laughs> wait for teachers to teach them. And if something seems complicated, who here actually waits for someone to teach them? Sometimes, not always. But I think the reason why people put their hand up is, and one reason why, is because we don't have the confidence to act on our ideas and to, to actually make things work for us to learn and to find a way to learn. And so, maybe there is a way for education to be more about taking ownership. So my story is about that, about appreciating taking ownership and still surrounding ourselves by the people that teach us. So, I was born and raised in South Africa, the son of a French mother and a South African father. So I had a mixed culture family. Um, and that would come up in a way we'd have to learn how to, how to greet in South Africa, where we'd smile and hug, and to greet in France, where you'd also kiss your family, and you can't mix the two up. And another thing is how you'd be educated. So uh, in South Africa, I went to South African school, in classes and such, and in front, in, well, in South Africa, I still did correspondence courses for French school, so I worked from textbooks. So I did both of these, but really, when I got to university, neither of these approaches worked. The textbooks didn't tell me exactly what to learn, and also, well, teachers didn't come to teach me personally, so there was something a little strange. And there's a class in particular, physics, that I struggled with a lot. I didn't know half the concepts or how they worked, so I didn't understand if I'd learned from home and did all the exercises and spent all the hours, what was going on? Something else had to happen for me to learn. So, what happened next was I passed the course, and I don't know how I did it. But in 2018, I was offered to do a project in innovation engineering innovation, so the options were fluid mechanics, material science, and other things. But what really mattered to me was that physics class. Like, how many, how many other students actually also struggled? Not because they didn't work hard enough, but because they weren't empowered to ask for what was missing in their learning environment. I went to the lecture of that course, and I asked him, I pitched the possibility of working on a project in his course. And I was emboldened by all my experiences in learning, and it turns out the lecturer let me work in the course. And I got to work with 170 students and eight tutors, all for the sake of a year of trying to improve my education. And so here's the story as a result. The first question was, even though we, the students would be learning and teachers would be trying to teach as much as possible to everyone, we didn't know if everyone was learning from the concepts. So the challenge was, are oh, students really understanding the material that's given to them? And this was a difficult one. So I went to classes, I went to work hours with the students, and really, I didn't get the concepts. Not half the concepts, so I asked the students to explain it to me, and yes, they would explain it to me, but sometimes they would say, no, I don't understand it, I'm gonna go work from home. And I started catching, up, catching on that, it turned out a lot of students wanted to do learning in their own time. So the project became how do we encourage students to learn in their own time? And this would mean solitude, and 
given and encouraging students to be in solitude to assimilate concepts, and then afterwards to come and tell us what they need. So, we wanted them to ask questions. And by asking questions, we wanted them to go home, and my idea was to go home and ask questions to the tutors in their own time. So we built a forum, and we wondered if students would ask, and sure enough, they did. So that seems like the problem was solved, but we got responses a little bit more interesting, where students actually avoided asking questions, and I wondered why, so I surveyed the students and I asked them if they'd rather be anonymous. And as you can see, 400 students that answered, 50% did not want to reveal their name, and 93% well, didn't want some level of anonymity. So the results were pretty clear. It's something asking questions, but it's something else wondering if we should ask the questions. And maybe that is obvious, maybe it isn't. But a lot of the things about asking questions is about asking for permission to ask a question. It's about asking if we should and if people will think we're stupid. So let me ask you in the audience now, how many of you think that you shouldn't ask a question and sometimes don't ask a question because you think it's stupid. I definitely do that from time to time. So, here's my idea. I would go from a forum to another medium for students to learn. And what I did was design a mobile application where students could be anonymous if they wanted to, but also they could ask a question whenever they wanted to and the tutors received it in the pocket. And I have to remind you, I was a student engineer, not, not an app developer, but the challenge that was this educational problem, that was, that was deemed highly complex, and I think it was worth the risk. So, we built an app, we put it online, students started using it, and they started asking questions, and that was great. But those questions didn't really give us insights into whether they understand the course. So I could have stopped there. And instead, well, an app helps us to ask the students even more questions about how they're learning and how about their learning environment. And this medium helped us to get feedback from the students about their learning environment. And that was a personal success. In fact, we even got people who said, Nothing stopped me to post on Zap. So, what we had was a, a space, a medium, where students started taking charge of their learning. And this was what I envisioned at the beginning, and that was something that really affected change. And I came out of nowhere and realized I could make a high impact with this project. But this was three years ago. Three years ago, and now I'm introduced to you as the founder of a drone lab. So, uh, you could say I've changed and I've shifted from studying how students learn to how robots learn. <laughs> but that's not entirely true. I consider myself to be a techno-optimist. I believe that technology can fundamentally improve the human condition. The project we saw now was a, an attempt at bringing education closest to students. And I think we live in an age where new mediums and new tools can bridge those gaps that haven't been bridged before. So, the big question is, now I'm going to drug technology, where is higher learning in all of this? And maybe we should ask this question, since it is the subject of the talk. And I think that universities teach skills, and they teach the application of those skills, but they also teach a mindset of learning, an approach, because learning is a fundamental part of the human condition. We need to practice it, we need to train it, and it helps us become better versions of ourselves. That's what I believe. And that's great, but it doesn't detract from the communities surrounding the skills that we learn. And those communities are often in higher learning. So what I did was go to a new university, in order to learn, um, drug technology in fact, 
And I went overseas in order to go to an innovation laboratory, our very own innovation laboratory here at the Pulp. And then, well, and then I didn't have skills and I didn't have anyone to teach me those skills, but the app project really emboldened me to create things like that platform. And that, that's really when COVID hit. <laughs> that's when I was sent home to do my education from home. And across Europe, students were sent home for about six months. So, gee, I had to test if my approach to learning really worked. So, I was at home, and I started researching drone testing facilities like crazy. And I learned that to fly multiple drones, you need cameras all surrounding the drones, and those cameras need to communicate with a companion computer. So I was in lockdown and I didn't have any of that. But I decided, well, let's come in contact with other drone laboratories who would talk to me about that architecture and explain it to me a little more. And they explained how, how it works. And I got an idea for it, but I tested it. And I tested it at home on my computer with simulated robots. And I threw away some ideas. And when I came out of that period, I started building things, and I had a clear picture of where to go, and it's this mindset that I'm sharing with you today. When we've packed, when we've packaged all these concepts, we eventually went, got to create a drone laboratory. And in 2021, uh, last year, another student approached me with the idea of creating drones that respond to hand movements. So this was quite an ambitious project. You point somewhere, and the drone just goes there. But having built resources to trade new ground, I partnered up with that student, and we developed a piloting software, and months later, we showcased it, a drone that responds to hand movements to the Department of Defense. We were pretty proud. And we continued with other students, where I imparted skills and they also brought their own, and we, each student had a spark of innovation. And that's something that I wanted to keep at the drone app, this mindset of innovation. So I devised five rules, five rules for creating new things. And perhaps anyone with a spark of innovation would be interested in us. The first is to solve challenges on your own. You might come to the drone lab to develop a new skill, but the first step is to do your own project. So we give you a project to build something, build the robot, try to turn it, to move it, to race it even, and to learn different technologies. But if you solve key challenges on your own, then you can start understanding what works for you. The second thing is to find the exact nature of your goal. You might want a drone that races the fastest in a race, but perhaps the drone doesn't fly yet, so focus on the drone flying. So that would be the exact nature of your goal, and perhaps there's more, but with each step, you're bringing your plan into reality, and that's a key element in problem solving. Three, focus all your energy on one goal at a time. And what that means is, Goals, goals are our drivers. Each goal brings up the next goal. And what we really are looking for is for a goal to always be there. And as long as we spend time, putting time into that goal, we actually get to where we want to be. Number four, keep putting in the hours. And that means always to cut down on a problem until you get to the heart of it. It turns out no problem is remotely scary or impossible if we keep putting in the time. So, I'm sure there are some problems, but in my experience, this is the key element, is to just keep going at it. And for those who, who hear about this journey and who want to be encouraged to do their own thing, and for those who are waiting for others to teach them, like I was, I dedicate this last point. Your time is worth so much more than you know. With time, you can do anything. You can 
definitely seek the people of knowledge, but understanding the worth of your time is so important. And to do things and to make time to do things is difficult, of course, because it's about balance. It's about balancing the things you want to do with the things that you have to do. Things you do for yourself with the things you do for others. The things you do because you worry about today and the things that you aspire to do. And I could go on about how to change the state of education, but what I learned in my journey is how to grow into someone who takes charge of their learning. And perhaps you can see that and also be empowered. Maybe anyone can be empowered. And when I say anyone, I think specifically of my little brother Matt, who struggled with the state of education, with the education system, and didn't have the patience of teachers like I did. But Matt remains able to do anything he wants to do and anything he sets his mind to. So I believe in you, Matt. We all do. Thank you.